Welcome to Magic Arcanum, I'm Ryan Gomez. Behind the scenes is Nicole Burdick, and we're so glad you're here, because it's story time. Outlaws of Thunder Junction is the latest release for Magic the Gathering, and it completes a four-set arc started in Wilds of Eldraine, while also giving us a hint of things yet to come. The official story is available free online in six main chapters, along with four additional side tales, and then two epilogue entries that set the stage for our next big adventure. And the set itself features six story spotlight cards which capture key events from the official story. If you haven't collected all those spotlights yet, or don't have the time to read the extensive online chapters, well, you're in luck, partner, because I'm here to tell you what happens in Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Well, what happens in the main story, because that's what we're covering in this video, which is sponsored by Into the AM. They just launched their spring collection and new everyday pants, which I am wearing right now, but uh, you'll have to take my word on that. But, just to prove you can wear them every day, I wore mine on Eclipse Day, too. You couldn't see the sun, but you could see how great I looked in these pants. Premium, lightweight, four-way stretch fabric, zippered pockets, and a ton of color choices make these the perfect pants to wear when you head out to play magic. Or to wear when you stay in to play magic. Save 10% when you use my link down below or enter promo code MAGICARCANUM at checkout. Toss in some amazing graphic tees, a hoodie, a nice polo perhaps. Into the AM has everything you need to become the best dressed wizard at your next game night. All right, now let me tell you what happens in the cowboy hat set. The story starts with two Sterling Company guards waiting for a delivery at an omen path. An unidentified man comes through the omen path and hands over a package to the guards, who put it on a stagecoach and take off with it across the desert. Soon they are attacked by the Hellspurs and their leader, the fearsome scorpion dragon Akul, who relieves the guards of their lives and their package and proudly declares that finally the last key is his. Really, any time a story starts with the bad guy getting the thing they want, you know you're in for a wild ride. Anyway, we then cut over to Annie Flash and her trusty mount, Fortune. They've come across the ruins of the stagecoach and are surprised to find its strong box, full of actual money, is still here. Annie concludes that whoever attacked this stagecoach was after a bigger prize, and that gives her concern, but she helps herself to the leftovers and takes them back to a nearby town. We get a scene where Annie basically donates the contents of the box to the town, only asking for some basic supplies and food for her horse in exchange. We learn she cares a lot for the people here and is something of a Robin Hood, using her own talents to provide for the people of Saddlebrush. Annie then returns to her home for the night where she is approached by Oko, who says he needs Annie's special skills. It's mostly Annie's magical eye, which can see through illusions and also makes her a real sharpshooter, both valuable assets out here in the lawless land of Thunder Junction. Oko goes on to say he is assembling a team to steal an item from Akul, and he knows Annie has unfinished business with the dragon, meant to entice her to join up. She refuses, but then Oko points out, if it was this easy for him to find her here, then the Hellspurs could probably find her too. So if her goal is to put that part of her life behind her, well, maybe that's not gonna work out so good. Still, Oko gives her a chance to think it over and leaves Annie with a matchbook from a saloon in a different town, so she'll know where to find him if she changes her mind. We then cut over to Kellen, who has been on the plane for a few weeks after Ezram confirmed his dad was around here somewhere. As we learned previously, Kellen's dad is Oko, 
and the last handful of sets have been largely about him tracking down the elusive planeswalker. So now he is getting close, but at the moment, Kellen is working on a relay tower for a communication network designed by Ral Zarek. The goal here is to use the omen paths to connect the planes with Ravnica as a central hub of commerce. And I guess somebody figured it was worth wiring Thunder Junction into the grid, even though it's mostly an empty dust bowl. Kellen catches Ral's eye when he uses his powers of flight to save a worker who falls off one of the tall towers. Ral realizes there is something special about Kellen and invites him to come along as he heads to a town called Prosperity to visit the Sterling Company headquarters. Now, we have established the danger of Akul, the presence of Oko, the reluctant involvement of Annie Flash, and the eager search of Kellen. All within the first chapter. Pretty good so far. No story spotlight cards yet, but whatever, that's fine. On to chapter two. Annie has given it some thought, and she's decided to accept Oko's offer for one last job, and... Oh hey, there we go. She digs up her buried thunder rifle and heads to the address on the matchbook Oko gave her, figuring she would prefer to face Akul on her own terms rather than wait for him to come find her and potentially harm the innocent people of Saddlebrush. So now we enter the saloon Oko is using as his base of operations, and we learn he's already assembled quite a team. We quickly get introduced to Tiny Bones, Malcolm. Reaches, Gisa, Geralt, Ariat, Vraska, and Rakdos. If you don't know who all these people are, well, they are a collection of outlaws from around the multiverse, handpicked for their unique talents, and each hoping for a big payday here on Thunder Junction. Oko explains that the plan is to rob Mag Taranau, which we are told is the only structure on Thunder Junction that predates the omen paths. Annie scoffs at this and says the place is a myth, but then Ashiok emerges from the shadows and says, oh no, I can assure you it's very real. Oko explains he was hired by Ashiok to assemble a team to break into this legendary vault, which is located within a town called Tarnation, which is the home base of the Hellspurs and their dragon leader, Akul. Annie then asks, if Akul already knows where the vault is, why hasn't he just taken everything from it? And we learn that Akul doesn't actually have all the necessary keys. The one he acquired at the start of the story was a decoy, and the last real key is in the hands of one Bertram Greywater, head of the Sterling Company. So Oko wants his team to steal that key first and also rescue two other team members being held in the jail cells at Prosperity. Then they will tackle Tarnation. Annie is unsure about all of this, but still figures whatever power the vault contains probably shouldn't end up with Akul, so she agrees to go along with everything, at least for now. We jump to Prosperity, where the gang has two objectives. Oko disguises himself as a courier and walks in the front door with a delivery for Greywater, while Annie and Ariat sneak in the back and head for the holding cells, where they will rescue the last two members of the group. We discover they are Kayervek and Satoru Umezawa. Ariat uses her charm magic on the guards and releases these two, while Oko searches Greywater's office for the vault key. Eventually, he finds it behind a portrait, because it's always behind a portrait, but as he goes to exit the building, he runs into Ral Zarek and Kellen. Oko's illusion magic falters as he looks at Kellen and realizes he's another fae, which allows Ral to realize something is happening here, and he calls the guards to stop Oko. Oko shapeshifts into an eagle and flies away, with most of the Sterling Company chasing him, as well as Kellen, who also realizes something is happening here. 
Oko decides it is too dangerous to try and fly past all of the armed guards, so he lands and shapeshifts back into his normal form, and Kellen lands too, eager to talk rather than fight. Kellen explains he is Oko's son and has been searching for him, and Oko is surprised when Kellen uses his own magic to push back the encircling Sterling Company guards. We get a brief fight scene in which Ral is shocked to see Vraska is alive, and Rakdos drops the hammer on a bunch of draft chaff before Oko and his gang manage to escape, taking Kellen along with them. This brings us to chapter three, where Oko sizes up Kellen and promises to explain more about the vast potential granted to him by his fey heritage, but only if he can count on Kellen to help out with this current mission. Kellen is so eager to earn approval from his mysterious father that he agrees, at least for now, and the gang turns their attention to the key which they realize they don't know a lot about. Kayervek says it's possibly older than the Thran or even the Phyrexians, and Annie says there happens to be an expert on ancient artifacts right here on Thunder Junction, but he's currently being taken to Prosperity on a train. So now we're off to do a train heist. Yeehaw! The plan is to have breaches blow up a bridge and force the train to stop. Then Gisa will summon an army of zombies to distract the guards, while Oko and Kellen and Umazawa will search the train for their target, a man named Nolan. Of course, Gisa summons these zombies early, which means when Breaches blows the bridge, there's no conductor to stop the train because he's already dead. That puts us in a race against time as the train approaches a canyon at full speed and Kellen and Oko have to get past the remaining guards. Father and son work well together and find Nolan. Kellen wants to stop the train, which is still full of civilian passengers, but Oko says, eh, we don't really have time for that. Annie has ridden up alongside the speeding train on her Mount Fortune and is ready to receive Nolan and Umazawa, who got wounded in the battle with the guards. Kellen demands they do something about the train, but Oko says, nope, not my problem, and jumps off after the others. This leaves Kellen to have his Spider-Man 2 moment, where he uses his own magical vines to create a mystical tether that slows the train long enough for all of the innocent people to clear out. Reinforcements from Sterling Company start closing in, so Annie grabs Kellen, and they make a daring escape as what's left of the empty train sails into the canyon below. Now we are on to chapter four of the main story, which starts with Ashiok reading Nolan's mind to get information about the key. The group learns that it is one of six keys, and the other five are held by Akul in a chain around his neck, so if they want to open the vault in Tarnation, they have to get those as well. But first, they still need to find Tarnation, because despite it being the home base of Akul and his gang, nobody actually knows where it is. Fortunately, Ashiok was able to seize the secrets from Nolan's mind and learned there is a map to Tarnation buried in a place called Thief's Folly, a graveyard for prospectors. So Gisa and Geralt are sent to retrieve it. The rest of the group heads back to the saloon, minus Annie and Kellen, because they are the only ones who seem to care about what happens with Nolan, so they take a little detour to drop him off somewhere safe and enjoy a friendly chat along the way. Annie explains her history with Akul to Kellen. A while back, she was part of a gang that robbed from the Hellspurs, and when Akul came for vengeance, he badly injured Annie's nephew, so she has felt guilty about that ever since. This gets Kellen to reflect on his own family situation, and he carries that into our next scene, back at the saloon, where Team Innistrad has just returned with the map to Tarnation. Oko begins to plan the heist. A small group will infiltrate Tarnation in disguise and get the rest of the keys away from Akul. 
Then they'll hit the vault, which is actually floating above the town itself. Realizing his son is still willing to do anything for him, even after the train thing, Oko selects Kellen for the infiltration mission, along with Annie, Vraska, and himself, of course. We jump ahead a bit to another saloon, this time in Tarnation, where the disguised crew is looking for a member of Akul's inner circle, hoping they will lead them to the big guy. Kellen gets into an altercation with some Hellspurs in the saloon, and a fight breaks out, which results in the whole team getting captured and brought before Akul. Before you ask, yes, Oko actually planned for this to happen, though we don't learn about that until later in the story. Anyway, the group is in Tarnation's prison now, which is at the bottom of an old rock quarry, so they figure there's no way they're getting out. Akul taunts them and even thanks Oko for bringing him the final piece he needed, because, yeah, Oko is carrying that sixth key, so the dragon takes it and adds it to the others. We then learn it's not six keys, but one key with six pieces. And honestly, I'm not sure why that matters. I mean, functionally, it is still a lock that needs six keys, but the story treats this like a big reveal. So, whatever. Akul then says he's going to kill everyone now, and Kellen says, wait, you can't, because I challenge you to a duel. And at first, Akul is like, uh, so what? I can just kill you right here. So then Oko and Annie chime in and call him a coward right in front of his army of Hellspurs. So of course, he actually caves and agrees to the duel, lest anyone think he is afraid to face a little kid. Like, man, you're already the boss. You're about to open the vault and get all the power and treasure, and you're clearly strong enough to kill everyone in this room. Why take the bait? And before you say it was Oko's magic or something, the story actually takes time to tell us the crew is being held with restraints that dampen powers. So no, this was just a nat 20 on the charisma check. We go to chapter five, featuring a duel at high moon, or midnight, because everyone's out of sunscreen, I guess. Kellen is released from his handcuffs, so now his magic does work, and the rest of the group is put into the stands to watch his duel with Akul. That is when Kellen turns the dragon into a stag, just like his dad. <laughs> Can you imagine? Okay, no, for real. He dodges several of the dragon's attacks, and then digs deep and comes up with the magic to put Akul into a sort of trance. So it's not a total transformation, but it does buy him some time. Which is great, because a moment later, Ral Zarek and the Sterling Company arrive and start attacking the Hellspurs. In the chaos, Akul returns to normal, but drops his keychain. Kellen picks it up and tosses it to Oko, who we learn was wearing tiny bones as part of his disguise, so now the little skeleton is reassembled and gets everyone out of their magical handcuffs. Annie, Oko, Vraska, and Tiny Bones manage to escape during the crossfire, but Kellen gets caught again, this time by the Sterling Company, and so they leave him behind. Oko then tells the others that this was the plan all along. He sent the location of Tarnation to the Sterling Company and anticipated them arriving, which would create an opportunity to get into the vault while the Hellspurs were distracted with defending their territory. Annie says, well, that's great, but what about Kellen? You know, your son. And Oko says, well, we're here to do a job, so let's do that first, and then I'll come back and save the kid. But it's very clear he doesn't really want to do that part. We cut over to Kellen, who is locked up in a Sterling Company carriage, but is then suddenly freed by Ral's Eric. Ral explains he is here to set up a communication network and really doesn't want somebody opening a vault with untold magic in it because that could ruin everything, not just here, but across the whole multiverse. So he asks Kellen for help. 
Kellen agrees. Nobody should have what's in that vault, including Oko, who he has realized was manipulating him this entire time. So Ral and Kellen decide to take whatever is in the vault and move it to a safe location on another plane and just lock it up again, which um, introduces a whole lot of other questions, but we don't have time for that because we're off to the final chapter of the main story. We open with Oko and the rest of his gang at the entrance of the vault, and we spend a little bit of time getting past some booby traps before Akul shows up and raises the stakes. The group has to fight off the dragon and his hellspurs while Kervak tries to disable the last ward. And when it falls, Vraska and Oko rush through the opened doorway, leaving the others to deal with the attackers. Before Oko can use the key to unlock the final door, however, he is stopped by Kellen and Ral, who somehow made it through the Hellspurs and the other gang members in the previous room. This is the betrayal at the vault, where Kellen fights Oko, and Vraska reveals she needs whatever is in the vault, and she's not really doing this job for the money offered by Ashiok. And that's great, because Ashiok then also appears, and things settle down long enough to get the vault door open, and we learn Ashiok is really Jace, and has been this whole time. Jace and Vraska approach a sort of glass tank within the vault, and crack it open to reveal a creature that we will eventually come to know as Loot, though that name is not used in the main story. Vraska tells Oko his services are no longer needed and starts to turn him to stone, but he planes walks away before she can finish, so she and Jace leave with loot. The vault then begins to tear itself apart in classic Indiana Jones fashion. So Kellen and Ral run for the exit, picking up Annie and the rest of the gang along the way. Rakdos had defeated Akul, but the dragon still makes one more play for vengeance and tries to grab Annie. Kellen uses his newfound hypnotic powers to mind control Akul and forces him to release Annie, then walk himself into the crumbling vault. This is Getaway Glamour, the final story spotlight card in which Akul is defeated and the vault is destroyed. We then get two final wrap-up scenes. The first features Oko, who has returned to the saloon to meet up with what remains of his gang. They are somewhat bitter about the fact that they won't be paid for this job, but Oko says we can sit here and be mad at each other about it or work together to get revenge at some point in the future. The others agree to this with various promises made about tripling their own fee next time, but for the most part, it looks like we have the start of a unified team of outlaws with Oko remaining as their ringleader. So be ready to see more of them in the future. And finally, we come back to Annie's ranch, where Kellen is helping her with some field work, and he's enjoying these quiet moments while he deals with the revelation that his father is a jerk. Ral appears and offers Kellen a job back on Ravnica, but Kellen declines and says, he is done wandering the multiverse, at least for now. Plus, he's expecting someone. As if on cue, Amalia arrives on horseback, saying she got Kellen's message on the new Omen Path telegraph system, and she is excited to start mapping Thunder Junction with Kellen as they share a meaningful embrace. And that's it. That's what happens in Outlaws of Thunder Junction. To recap, Ashiok, who is really Jace, hires Oko to assemble a team to break into a mysterious treasure vault. Competing for the contents of said vault is Akul, a fearsome dragon, and Ral Zarek, trying to protect the multiverse and his own considerable investments in this plane. Kellen finds his dad and joins his gang, and we get a jailbreak, a train robbery, and a high moon duel before cracking the vault and learning it was a setup all along. Raska and Jace make off with loot, Kellen settles down with Amalia, and Oko keeps his gang together, plotting payback when the time is right. It might be the most rootin' tootin' story magic has ever told, and that's just the main chapters and spotlights. But there is still plenty left in the tumbleweeds, so let's cover that with a little segment I like to call 
the Mustache Minute. Ready? Here we go. Okay, first of all, credit where credit is due. A lot of the smaller character interactions in this story were pretty great. I didn't get into all of them for the recap, but stuff like Kervac and Umazawa constantly bickering, or Rakdos being amused by the minuscule skeleton jester that is Tiny Bones, there were some genuinely solid bits. However, I do think the roster was maybe a tad too big. I forgot Ariat was part of the gang at all at one point because she mostly charms a guard or puts someone to sleep and then sticks to the fringes of the battle, for example. I'm not even counting the insane number of legendary creatures in the set, most of which have no presence in the actual story. I just mean Oko's gang itself is a lot. And weirdly, the other villains are pretty generic. You've got the power-hungry Akul, and we get the names of a few of his inner circle from Annie, but otherwise it's just the Hellspurs chase Oko and the Outlaws, which is a little bit bland. Early in the story, they make a point of saying that two Sterling Company guards are escorting this mysterious package, so it must be a big deal because it is expensive to hire two guards for a job like this. But then, as the story goes on, we see dozens of these guys fighting and dying left and right, so I'm not sure if they're supposed to be valuable or if somebody in the payroll department is getting fired. When Oko tells the gang that their job is to rob Mag Terranau, I was hooked. This sounded like an exotic and mysterious place, but the name never really comes up again, and as far as I can tell, it's never called that on the cards either. Instead, we have the Fomori Vault, which looks to be sitting on the ground, but in the story, it is a flying vault, which added to the mystery of its origins and its power. So I was kind of disappointed to see this be the card we got because it doesn't match up with what is described. Then I noticed Kellen has a vault-like structure in his art, but it's different, like it's set into the side of a cliff or something. I'm not sure what that's supposed to be. But let's talk about the contents of the vault for a moment, shall we? In the story, it just contains loot, who is presumably a baby Fomori that was in some sort of stasis until picked up by Jason Vraska. Now, why they want that child, I will cover in another video because it is part of the epilogue chapters and not the main story that we're talking about here today. We can address the so-called big score though, which was supposed to be a sort of aftermath style expansion that they folded into the main set instead. And on those cards, we see all sorts of fancy treasure that presumably came from the same vault as loot, except there was nothing like that in there. So yeah, that's a little weird, right? Kaladesh had the inventions, which could have been just off screen during the inventor's fair or whatever, but I'm not sure why these cards are called the big score and seem to be treasures from the Fomori vault that straight up do not exist. Are they supposed to just be treasures from other planes? Why would someone bring them to Thunder Junction for storage? I feel like I'm missing something here. My other two small hangups are, one, where does Gisa get her zombies during the train scene? She has to call the ghouls, right? She doesn't make them out of magic, she reanimates corpses. Was the train full of dead bodies? Did she summon an army from the passing desert? and it somehow caught up with the moving train? I am unclear. And lastly, how does nobody know where Tarnation is? What direction does Akul and his gang go after every assault? Or better yet, who built the town? I don't think a scorpion dragon and his outlaw buddies are eager to pick up a hammer and build their own outhouses. In fact, the story tells us the prison cells holding Kellen and the others are at the bottom of an old rock quarry, so at one point this town was presumably used by some other faction and thus probably exists on a lot of other maps. And remember, it has a floating vault right overhead too, so you would be able to see this place from quite a ways off, right? I don't want to harp on this one too much because it was a pretty fun ride. I enjoyed Kellen getting the 
Same lesson about Oko we all got, and seeing all of the other villains interact with each other helped flesh out some really great characters. But what about you? Do you understand what happens in Outlaws of Thunder Junction? Do you think the set's six spotlight cards capture the important events of that story? And do you think Oko and his remaining gang are a credible threat for future stories? Or should we be more worried about Jace, Vraska, and the mysterious loot? Hmm. Let me know in the comments and grab your partner and do -si do on over to Into the AM while you're there. My link saves you 10% on everything they've got, including their amazing new everyday pants. Then make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the great stories you'll only find here on Magic Arcanum. We'll see ya.